jump straight into today's message. The children's story will connect with the message. So here we go. Hi kids, it's Pastor Stephen. How about a children's story today? I want you to meet Martha and Mary. Now they were very excited because they had a very special guest coming to their house. The visitor was a very important teacher and they were excited about all the things that they might learn that day. To prepare, Martha cleaned and cooked and was all over the kitchen. She wanted to show the teacher that she was a good person and good at what she did. So she worked very hard. Mary didn't do very much because she was too busy listening to the teacher. And what he was saying was so very good. When Martha saw that Mary wasn't helping, she got very upset. She was doing all the work by herself. Very rudely and without thinking about the guests, she went up to the teacher and said, Oh teacher, tell my sister to get back to work. She hasn't done anything at all except listen to you talk and I'm here working all day. The teacher wisely listened to every word she said, thought about it, and then gave a response. Martha, I appreciate everything that you've done here, but realize I didn't come here just for you to serve me. I came to serve you, to teach you things and your sister and these friends, and so that you can get to know who I am. After listening to the teacher's wise words, she stayed there too and listened to the teacher as he spoke about marvelous and wonderful things. He truly was a good person. I'm sure some of you kids out there realize that I just copied from a Bible story. But the message is the same. There's a lot of important things that we do in life, like work and cleaning and all of these things. But the most important of all is to get to know Jesus and to listen to him. So I hope you all do that today. All right, everyone. Goodbye. All right. So let's let's pray. Uh, we're going to do the same thing that we did last week, which is uh, I'll, I'll do the, the message and then we'll pray and then we'll open it up for any discussions, any questions uh, that people might have. OK, so let's just pray one more time and we'll jump straight into today's message. God, thank you Lord, for bringing us all here. It's your Sabbath day. It's a day to rest, but it's also a day to get to know you better, just like Mary did sitting at the feet of Jesus, Lord, and, and hearing him speak, hearing him uh, tell the truths of the universe, Lord. I pray, Lord, that today we could do the same thing, that we can sit bef before you, Lord, before your Bible, before your word, uh, and listen to your word, and, and not just hear it, but understand it um, and follow it, Lord. Be with all of us here today. Uh, bless us, protect us. For those that might be listening on later on when it's recorded, uh, thank you so much for the Bible, for giving us all these wonderful truths, Lord, in your mighty word. So be with us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so you might remember last week we talked about uh, Eve, right? The creation story. Um, and what I was trying to focus on was on the equality between the two. At the end of the sermon, we had a few people coming up and, and giving us some verses from Ellen White and that, talking about how, you know, Adam was above Eve and so on. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about today. But I want you to realize the difference between last week and today. Last week, we talked about the equality of the person itself, all right? Personal worth. Both Adam and Eve were created in the image of God, not one above the other. They were both made in the image of God. Uh, both of them uh, were made compatible, all right? Which means that they could, you know, they were, one wasn't a human and the other one was an animal, like, you know, like Adam saw. They were made so that they could be compatible together, all right? So what we're talking about there is self-worth. What we're going to be talking about today is position or leadership, all right? That hierarchy that, um, that does exist, all right? Uh, well, what we're going to do is we're going to read the Bible, you know, read the verses, um, and actually see what it says there, all right? Ephesians chapter 5 is, uh, is a chapter that's been used throughout the ages, right, since it's been written. Um, and, well, let's read it, and then, and then you can make up your own minds, all right? So let's read it. I'm going to open up the, the PowerPoint here. 
and um, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to read it backwards, all right? Um, so for those that know Ephesians chapter 5, the, the, the area that we're going to be specifically focusing on here, which is the, uh, the, uh, the counsel to husbands and wives, uh, it, usually, it starts with the wives first and then the husbands. We're going to reverse that. We're going to read the husbands first and then backtrack and read the wives. But realize that they come in a packet, all right? They come together. The way that they're written um, is, is very much parallel, all right? So counsel to the men, counsel to the women. Uh, and, and so I want you to read that these two ideas do go together, all right? So I entitled this, Who's the Boss? Because that's what we're talking about today. Uh, position, authority, leadership, uh, headship, all right? So let's first go to the husbands. And this is what it says. If you have a Bible there, you can look it up yourself. I'm reading from the, the New King James. You can read it from whichever Bible you enjoy. Uh, but Ephesians chapter 5, I'm going to start on verse 25, okay? And this is what it says. Let's read it nice and slowly. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. All right, let's stop there for a second. So the first part is very simple, right? The, the, the counsel that uh, Paul is telling the husbands of the church is, husbands, you have to love your wives, all right? You have to love your wives. And then he makes a comparison, all right? You have to love your wives the same way Christ loves the church or loved the church. And then he takes it a step further. Part of that love, so this is where we get an expanding idea of what it actually means to love your wife, right? So husbands, love your wives the same way Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. So husbands here who are listening, um, part of your responsibility is to give yourself to your wife, all right? And what we're, what we're actually going to see that in the future is it extends as far as your own life, you should be willing to die for your wife, all right? That's part of the love that husbands have to have for their wives. But he continues on, verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present to her, to himself, a glorious church, all right? So, Husbands, you have to love your wives. And then we have this comparison of Jesus. What does that actually mean? What does it mean? What's the responsibility of a husband loving his wife? The first part is, husbands, you have to be willing to give yourself to her. All right? That's the first part. The second one is helping her to be sanctified, to be cleansed, um, and to, to reach a point where your wife can be glorified. All right? So that he might present her to himself a glorious church. So think about this, husbands. The way you treat your, your wife, the way you love your wife, are you uplifting her so that she becomes glorified? Think about that. Because that's the requirement here. That's what loving your wife actually means here, all right? Paul is using Jesus' example between him and the church and saying, this is how you have to be with your wives, husbands to your wives, all right? So give yourself to her, uh, cleanse her, purify her, help her, uplift her so that she can reach a state, a state of being glorified, all right? And then it continues on, not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish, all right? So again, husbands, is this how you love your wives? Are you treating them in a way which purifies them, which uplifts them, which glorifies them, which, you know, makes them at that state of holiness? Um, think about that. Um, and without blemish. This connects to the idea that uh, the husband is the priest, right? I'm sure you've all heard this. Uh, the, 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 the man of the house should be the priest of the household. What that means is this right here. It is the the husband's responsibility, um, and again, 
Some of you might be hearing this and might not be liking what you're hearing. Just stay with me, all right? Hold on, hold on till the end. Um, but the, the responsibility is to, as the priest of the household, to make sure that the whole household is holy, all right? Is being uplifted, is being glorified, all right? The same way Christ day and night works to make his church holy and glorified, all right? Does that make sense up until now? It's very simple what it's saying, all right? That is the, that's what it means for a husband to love his wife. But he continues. Um, the, the man's part is actually a much, much longer than the women's. So there's a lot more to it. So then it continues on and it goes like this. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. Now think about what that saying is. You have to love your wives as much as you love yourself or your own bodies which again goes back to the Genesis story of the idea of equality, right? So who should you love more? Should you love yourself more or your wife more? And the answer is neither. You should love each other as if it was the same body, all right? So love your wife as much as you love yourself. Um, so every time you do something nice for yourself, you gotta make sure you're also doing something nice for your wife, right? That has to be that equality there. Treat both equally. That's really what this verse is saying. Husbands, you have to love your wives as your own bodies. So there should be this equality there in how you love and act one to another. He who loves his wife loves himself. Uh, and then verse 29, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does to the church. So the final part is, husbands, you have to nourish and you have to cherish your wives. So uh, without your wives looking at you, is that what you do? Do you nourish your wife? Do you cherish your wife? And do you make sure she, she knows that, right? Uh, I know in marriage counseling, a lot of times that comes up. My husband never says that he, he loves me. And he's like, I do all the time. I give you this and I get, um, but there's this disconnect in terms of actually showing that cherishing, right? Showing that love to the other person. So all of these things is connected to that very simple verse of husbands love your wives. Uh, so this is what it comes down to. If we make a list of the husband's responsibilities in the household, it's this here. Husbands need to love their wives, which includes husbands need to give their wives for them or give themselves. They have to give their own lives to their wives. All right. Husbands need to uplift their wives to have them glorified. That was that, that spiritual part, right? That cleansing, that purification. So husbands need to uplift their wives to have them glorified. And finally, husbands need to nourish and cherish their wives. All right, everyone's okay with that so far? Does that make sense? Do you see that? Again, we're just reading the Bible, right? We're just seeing what the Bible is saying, what that actually means for husbands to love their wives. All right, but we can also learn something else from this story. Wives do not need to love their husbands, all right? Wives don't need to give their lives for them. Wives don't need to uplift or, or, or make their husbands glorified. And, hu and wives don't need to nourish or cherish. Because again, the verse was very specific, right? This is the job of the husbands to the wives, never the other way around. Do you agree with me? Is everyone okay with that? All right? I, I'm seeing some head bobbing a little bit. Maybe a little bit. People don't agree with this, maybe. I'll explain why this is vitally important. You either have to accept this and say, well, it was specifically talking about husbands, therefore wives do not need to do these things. Or you assume. Why are you so Go ahead. Uh, um, or you assume that this is specifically talking to husbands because this is something that husbands were lacking. All right. So he specifically focuses on the husbands so that they get this message. Um, 
so it, it, now you get to choose and I'm going to give you the option. It's, it's your own life. It's your own marriage. And you can choose how you want to interpret this. All right. How you see it uh, and how the Bible is trying to explain it. You either accept the fact that this is only talking about husbands and therefore wives do not need to do these things. Or you accept the idea that he's specifically talking about husbands because this is what they're worst at. But it also includes wives. Obviously, wives should love their husbands and cherish them and uplift them and so on. Uh, but I'm going to leave that up to you. All right. So now let's roll to the woman's uh, uh, section here. All right. So now we're going to backtrack a couple of verses. We're going to Ephesians chapter five. All right. And uh, again, just hold up with me. Wait until the whole sermon. Don't start throwing tomatoes or anything at the screen. Uh, I, I won't I won't touch it. You know, I, I won't feel it. All right. So verses 22, this is what it says. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. All right. This is what the Bible teaches. It's very clear. Uh, there's no mistakes in translations, nothing like that. Everyone pretty much agrees that this is how Paul wrote it. All right. Now, again, this is where how you the Bible also becomes apparent. Now, you can choose to believe that this is only talking to wives, has nothing to do with husbands. So only the wives should submit to their husbands. Uh, if that's how you want to read this, then you also have to read the, next, the other part the same way. Your wives do not need to love you. Your wives do not need to cherish you, nor nourish you, nor uplift you, nor give their lives to you. All right? You can't choose one one way of reading it for one section and then change how you read it for the next section. Do you understand that? Let me see what they're saying here. All right. Uh, women, wives should also do these things. It's a mutual love and respect. All right. All right. So that's one way of looking at it, right? But again, the second you say that, that way of reading this text, you have to apply it to both, right? So if you believe that it's, only men or only wives should submit to their husbands, then you're automatically saying that only the husbands should love their wives. Or if you believe that husbands have to love their wives, but also wives should love their husbands, then the same has to be applied here. Wives have to have to submit to their husbands, but likewise, husbands have to submit to their wives. Um, now, let's see if we can't figure out a little bit uh, which way the Bible teaches. Uh, well, this becomes very simple. For those that have a Bible, look at literally the verse right before 22. If you have your Bible there, um, you will see a verse literally right before that verse appears. And it says this, uh, and this is in context of the whole church, men, women, children, elderly, everybody. It says, submitting one to another in the fear of God, all right? So as a church family, we should all be submitting one to another, all right? And then we have verse 4, 22, which says, wives, submit to your own husbands, all right? Now, again, if verse 21 is saying that we have to submit one to another, why in the world is Paul then focusing only on women in verse 22 uh, in terms of wives, submit to your own husbands. Um, before we get to that answer, let's read a few other verses. This is found in 1 Peter 5, verse 5. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders, All right? Everyone says amen, in that, amen to that, especially if you're older, All right? If you're younger, you don't like this verse. Uh, but it continues on and says, yes, all of you be submissive one to another. Again, talking about the whole church here, the whole church should be submissive one to another. I should be submissive to you. You should be submissive to me and be clothed with humility. So now he's combining two ideas, the idea of submission one to another and the idea of humility. 
God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So the person that submits is humble. The person that refuses to submit is proud. All right. Now, the simple question is, which one are you? Are you the humble person or are you the proud person? And remember, there's a consequence to that. If you're a proud person, the Bible is telling you God resists the proud. God will resist you. But if you're humble, God gives grace to the humble. All right. So we read it in Ephesians 5, submit one to another. We've read it here in 1 Peter 5, right, which is um, submit one to another, connects the idea of humility. And now we can also, oh, I, I, I left out the other one. Um, let me go to the answer now. Why is it that Paul would focus on women submitting to their husbands and men loving their wives? Uh, this is taken from psychologytoday.com. Um, I just chose this one. There was other studies that I could have used. Um, but they looked at the number one complaints of men or husbands and women or, or wives. The number one complaint of men is this. I can't do anything right. I'm tired of being targeted, of nagging and complaining. So the number one complaint is the nagging wife. Or in other words, a wife who doesn't respect their husbands, you know, always thinks that their ideas are stupid, always uh, only, you know, whenever a husband does something, it's always negative. You did this wrong. You did that wrong. You should have done it this way. Uh, you know, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Um, so the number one complaint for men is women who don't respect them. All right. Who don't, um, who don't value their husbands. All right. The number one complaint for women is this. Uh, they pay more attention to the needs uh, or what they ask for is that the husbands pay more attention to the needs of the kids and the house without her constant reminder. Or in other words, the distant husband. Or in other words, an unloving husband, a, a husband that isn't showing love, isn't you know, living that loving life towards his wife. Now think about this. This is, you know, 2000 years apart from Paul's writings to today. And it's the exact same problem. All right. There's a reason why Paul says that we should submit one to another. And then he focuses on his, on the wives and says, listen, this is your weakest point. This is, this is where the men complain most. So this is why I'm telling you, women, submit to your husbands. Show them their value. Show them their worth. All right? Uh, respect them and, and so on. We're going to get into this in a little bit. And then he goes to the men and he says, and men, this is where you're horrible. This is your weak spot. And it's showing love to your wives. All right? So when you go to Ephesians 5, um, that's really what we're seeing there. We're seeing Paul saying, he's talking to the whole church, and he's saying, listen, you know, you have to love each other, you have to respect each other, you have to submit one to another, and then he focuses on men, he focuses on women, and he brings up what in general, this isn't everyone, right, but in general, this is the men's failings and this is the women's failings. Men are really bad at showing love and expressing love to their wives, and women, you're really bad at showing the value or respect to your husband. And that's why he brings this up. Now, there's going to be some of you who are saying like this, okay, that's all fine and good. I don't know if I believe that or not. But the fact is, going back to Ephesians 5, it's very clear. It says this, verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. You can't deny that. The husband is the head of the wife. Because you can't deny the fact that Christ is the head of the church. So regardless of submitting one to another, husbands are still the, the head of the wife. All right? I'm sure some of you are thinking that right now or wanted to express that. Um, I agree with you. That is what the Bible says here. Again, don't throw tomatoes yet. All right? Um, but that is what the Bible is telling us. All right? I believe in the Bible. All right. I believe in, in all the verses are inspired by God and God breathed 
And I completely believe in this. Uh, it says that husbands as the head of the wife is also Christ is the head of the church. Uh, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. All right. Uh, and in fact, it's not the only verse that says that. I, I, I put in 1 Corinthians 11.3 here uh, as, a com as a companion verse, and there's other ones, but this is what it says. Uh, I like this one in 1 Corinthians 11.3 because it kind of shows you the whole hierarchy. All right, so let's read it together. Uh, and then we can see if we can maybe explain this. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is man and the head of Christ is God. All right, so we get a very dis distinct hierarchy. At the top, we have God, God the Father. Below God the Father, we have Christ. Below Christ, we have husbands uh, or man. And then at the bottom, sorry, women, we have women. All right, that is what the Bible teaches. I can't stand here today and say it's not written. I can't say here today saying that, this verse was added in, you know, later on or anything like that. This is what the Bible teaches. But men, be careful what you wish for. All right. Because now we actually have to explain what this means. Okay. Um, so let's, let's look at what the verse is actually saying. It's specifically talking about Ephesians again. It says this. Husbands are the head of the wife or in other words the husband is the leader above the wife and then he makes a comparison and the comparison is what's important here as also christ is the head of the church right you see the two comparisons husband's the head of the wife christ the head of the church okay what does that actually mean because remember, when we talked about husbands love your wives, it was a lot more complicated than that, right? There was a whole explanation of what that meant. So now let's look at what it means to be the head of a household, just as Christ is the head of the church, all right? What is Jesus's example for husbands of how to be the leader, how to be the head? We jump to Philippians chapter 2 here. And this is what it says. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. All right. Now, I'm going to read. I'm going to stop here, but realize that this is talking about Christ's example. So how did Christ, as the leader of the church, interact with the church? Well, the first thing that he did was to make the church better than himself. That's how, you know, he, he that's how he esteemed the church as if it, as if the church was better than himself. Therefore, husbands, you also have to see your wife as better than you. All right? That's the first thing. What else does it mean to be a leader or to be the head? Let each of you look out not only for his own interest but also for the interests of others. Did Jesus do this? Absolutely, right? So again, husbands, your purpose in life is not just to look out for your own interests, but you also have to look at the interests of your wife, just as Christ didn't just live on this earth for, his, for himself, but he, he, he lived for the interests of his church, of his followers. All right, it keeps going. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Do you see the comparison there, right? Husbands, follow the example of Christ. That's what it's saying here. Let your mind, let your mind as a leader be the same as the mind that Jesus had as a leader. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, all right? Or in other words, lowered himself, taking the form of what? A bond servant. So husbands, as the head of the household, 
What that means is that you have to become the bond servant of the household. For those that don't know what a bond servant is, it is a slave who is not paid. So husbands, what it means to be the head of a household is to become the unpaid slave of your house. Are you with me? All right. That's what it means. Again, be of the same mind that Christ had. Follow Christ's example. Christ, as the leader, became the slave to his church. Became the servant to his church. All right. Uh, and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death of his cross. So again, part of being a leader, part of being the head is that you have to become obedient even to the point of death. This goes back to my earlier statements where you've got to put your wife first even to the point of death. All right? That's what it means to be a leader in Christ's eyes. All right? If you don't agree with me, Let's keep looking at what uh, Jesus actually says here. This is taken from Mark uh, chapter 9, verses 35. And he, Jesus, sat down, called the 12, and said to them, if anyone desires to be first, or in other words, if you desire to be the head, if you desire to be the leader, he shall be last of all and servant of all. So husbands, if you agree with Ephesians chapter 5, that you are the head of the household. Now, what that means is that you have to be last in the house. You have to be the servant of the house. This agrees completely with what Philippians spoke, right? Let's go to Matthew chapter 20 here. Matthew chapter 20 is very, very important. Um, I only put in, in, in verse 26, you get a hint of what the chapter is talking about. Uh, when you get a moment, read the verses before verse 26. And, and what Jesus is saying here is this. Um, the world has its perception of what a leader is. The world has its ideas of what being the head is. That's not the Christian way. The problem that happens with Ephesians 5 is we accept the biblical stance of saying husbands should be the head of the wives, but then we disregard the Bible in terms of what that means, and we focus on what the world means by that. Well, if I'm the head or the leader, then I get to do A, B, C, and D. Jesus is going against that here. He's saying, listen, a leader in the world is very different than a leader in the church or what it means for me, all right? So let's read verse 26, and you'll see that that's what he's saying. Yet it shall not be among you, but whoever desires to become greatest among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Verse 28, you'll see the comparison again with, with Ephesians 5. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So when Ephesians chapter 5 says that husbands are the head of their wives, I absolutely agree with that. I have no complaints with that. When the Bible says that men are, are the head of women, I agree. That's exactly what the Bible says. When Ellen White says that Adam was the head of Eve, I have no problems with that. When she says that husbands are the priests or the head of the household, I have no problem with that. The problem that I have is that you're taking those verses, but then applying the world standard of leadership in the household. And that's where you're absolutely wrong. That's where you absolutely fail. And that's why we have so many problems in marriages. Because you're trying, you're taking something from the Bible, but you're using worldly standards to, to apply that that idea to be the head to be the leader makes you the servant makes you the slave all right and suddenly if i was to ask the husbands do you want to be the head of the church they'll be like well or do you want to be the head of the household they'll be like no no we can share that we can 
You know, that verse is talking about both, right? Just as the husband loves his wife and the wives also love the husband, it's the same way, you know, wives should submit to their husbands. And yes, husbands should submit to their wives. That way, once in a while, the wife can be the slave too, right? Uh, suddenly people will be changing their minds here. But I want you to realize that, again, this is what the Bible says, not just in terms of what the power structure is, but what that power structure actually means, all right? So let's, let's go on. Now, we've already read Ephesians chapter 5 says submit one to another. That's fine. But it also says that husbands are the head, and that's absolutely fine. But then we read that being the head makes you the slave, makes you the bottom. Peter said that, Paul said that, Jesus himself said that. Now, let's not just look at the words. Now, let's actually look at Jesus' example here. Because Jesus' example will, will, will show us very clearly what that means in a practical sense. All right? So let's... Let's, we're going to stay in Matthew, by the way. We just read Matthew 20. We're going to now jump to Matthew 26. Uh, a very famous story. This is the Passover. All right. So we have Jesus with his church. Jesus with his disciples. They're, they're together, right? Look at how this story unfolds. Uh, we're going to start reading from verse 17. Now, on the first day of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, where do you want us to prepare for you uh, to eat the Passover. We're going to stop there for a second. I want you to realize that it wasn't Jesus that started this conversation. It was the disciples who went to Jesus and said, listen, we want to prepare the, the feast for you. We want to get the house ready, right? We want to get everything ready. Uh, it wasn't Jesus that, that, that had this idea. They took the initiative. Uh, and, and did this, all right? Jesus completely accepts it. He accepts their, their request. He accepts their question, and he gives the response. He, and he said, verse 18, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. Verse 19, so the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. So look at what's going on here. Um, who does the work in this story, in this part of the story? The disciples did, right? They went ahead, found the house, and prepared the house, prepared the feast for the Passover. Now, was Jesus just sitting around probably by the lake while the disciples were working? No. You can assume that Jesus was working during the same time. As they were getting the house ready, Jesus was outside working doing his ministry, doing his job, all right? So the first thing that we can see here is that's perfectly acceptable, all right? The, the church working for Christ, getting the house ready, you know, giving of themselves, asking Jesus, what can I do for you? How can I prepare this for you? That's perfectly fine. And, as, and, as, uh, you know, and, and while Jesus is out at work, the church does the work at home, all right? That's what this story is basically showing us. So if we were to convert this into a husband and wife, um, we, we have the husband who's working outside. Again, this is the, not everybody. I understand that nowadays women work too, and that complicates the whole story, but we'll get to that. Um, but in a situation where the husband was working outside uh, and the woman is at home, she prepares the house while the husband is at work. All right. That's basically what we're seeing here. It's not a perfect conversion, but that's kind of what we're seeing in this story. But realize that the second Jesus gets home, the dynamic changes. All right. Um, yeah. So we're going to jump to John chapter 13, which actually explains what happens inside the home. Uh, so the disciples have already prepared everything. Jesus was outside working, probably preaching, healing, who knows, you know, doing what he does. He gets home. All right. So now we have the whole family inside of the home. We've got Christ and the church or the husband and the wife. Look at what happens now. Jesus, knowing that the father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel, girded himself. 
And after he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Who is the servant and who is being served? It's very simple here, right? The church is being served by Jesus in a very physical way, right? So while Jesus was at work, yes, the church works. The second Jesus comes home, Jesus, as the leader, takes his position as the servant, washes his church's feet. Uh, in fact, if you were to read the whole story, Jesus is the one that breaks the bread. Jesus is the one that pours the, 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 the juice and passes it around, right? He is very much doing the role of the servant in the story. How do we apply that to our, our day now with husbands and wives? If we were to take this story as an example, what would that look like? So the husband goes out to work, the, the wife stays home and she cleans the house, she gets everything ready, whatever. And again, we're talking about in general, we know there's, there's a, well, especially nowadays, there's a lot of different dynamics now, but we're using this dynamic here. Um, so while the husband's out working, the wife is working at home. The second the husband comes home, what usually happens or what used to happen, if we go back even 50 years, the husband would come home, he would take off his boots, he would sit on the sofa, he would ask his wife for the newspaper and he would wait for the food to be ready, right? That, would, that was a, a very standard. Uh, probably many of you, if you're not living that now, you can remember your father living that way, all right? Um, but that is how the world worked for centuries, all right? The second the husband got home, um, he would just sit down and relax because he had a long day. He worked a long hours. Um, and the wife would continue doing the work. That isn't what we see in this story. If we apply this, this story into the life, what should happen is the husband's outside working while the wife is also working. The husband comes home, and the second the husband comes home, the wife stops working, sits on the sofa, and relaxes while the husband continues the work of the home. And you might stand up and say, well, that's ludicrous. The, work, the husband worked hard all day, to which my response would be, well, I'm pretty sure the wife did too, right? Um, but that's what this story is teaching us, right? When you, again, what, we always said, we had those bracelets back in the day, right? WWJD, what would Jesus do? Well, this is what Jesus did, right? The second he was together with his disciples again, he, as the leader, as the head, takes the role of the servant and works for the church. So husbands, according to Ephesians chapter 5, being the head, just as Christ is the head, when we come home, we should follow in Jesus' example. We should tell our wives to sit down. We should tell your wives, okay, now you can relax, sit on the sofa, and I will get everything else ready, right? That's just the honest truth, right? That's what we're reading in the Bible. I see people shaking their heads like it's the craziest idea in the world. That is what the Bible is telling us, all right? Again, we, we read the verses, and now we're seeing the physical interpretation of that. That's exactly what happened in the story. And it's not the only one. If we go to John chapter 21, you'll remember this story as uh, Jesus died, resurrected, and he's kind of popping in and out of stories, right? He just appears um, out, of, out of nowhere. Uh, let me see quickly what this chat is saying. Wow. <laughs> yeah, husband and wives, you're going to have some interesting conversations tonight when you go to bed. Um, but you'll know this story. Right, the disciples decide, let's go fishing. Right, so they go fishing, they're on the boat, they're fishing, they're doing their job, which is great. Right, they're staying busy, they're doing their work. Uh, we know the story, they're they don't get any fish. And then the stranger on the beach tells them, you know, put the net on the other side. They catch a bunch of fish at that moment. Peter recognizes that it's Jesus, right? So, again, Jesus and the disciples were separate, Jesus was on the land, the disciples were off on the lake uh at at one point of the story which is what we're about to read they join together again look what happens 
when Jesus and the church joined together again. Uh, verse, uh, starting from verse 9. Then as soon as they had come to land, or in other words, as soon as they got together, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. All right. But again, who is serving who in this story? Did Jesus say, okay, I'm the master here. So go make a fire. Go make some bread or go buy some bread. Go put the fish on. He doesn't say that. When they get there, Jesus again goes back into the role of the servant. He already has the food laid out. He already has prepared the fish and the bread. What's interesting in this story is you get the first glimpse of cooperation. Even though the fish and the bread is there, look at what he says in verse 10. Bring some of the fish which you have caught, basically signaling the idea of, you know, work a little bit here as well. Let's take some of those fish, put it on the fire, and, and we can eat what we both made today. All right? So what you start seeing is a cooperation in the story. Though who takes the initiative? Jesus does. He already has the fire, already has the fish and the bread laid out. Uh, verse 11, Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there was so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them. And likewise, the fish. Again, who's the one serving who? It is Jesus as the head doing the work of the servant. He's the one serving the bread and the fish to the family. I'm going to use my own example here now, uh, just not to step on anyone's toes. I guess I'm stepping on my parents' toes. <laughs> um, my dad, I don't think, has ever served himself at the dinner table. My mom has always served his food. Uh, all right. And she does it because she loves him and she loves to do that. It's it's her way of showing love to him. All right. But basically, my wife, uh, my, my mother has always served my uh, my my father uh, to the point that my there was days that my dad would go to work super early, five o'clock in the morning kind of a thing to go off to work. My mom would wake up earlier to make breakfast, to give him breakfast so that she could give him breakfast before he goes to work, all right? That was the culture, that was the lifestyle. And my mom to this day does that. She loves to do that. That's one of the ways that she expresses love uh, to, to my father, all right? But realize it's contrary to the Bible. It is Jesus who serves the disciples and not the other way around. Or in other words, it should be the head who serves the rest or the husband who serves the wife. That is what the Bible is teaching us. Now, some of you might be grinding this in your head. That's because you are so indoctrinated in the way the world sees leadership. That's why you're confused right now. You are filled with a worldly view of leadership and it's not compatible with the biblical and the godly form of leadership, all right? That's why you might be struggling right now, but that is exactly what the Bible is teaching us. Though again, in this story, we already get that glimpse of this sharing, right? Even though Jesus has prepared, he also asks the disciples to help out, right? Bring your fish so that we can cook together kind of a thing. Let's compare that idea now with the next story here. Uh, again, this is a famous story. This is when Jesus feeds the 5,000, all right? Uh, this is when Jesus feeds the 5,000. Look at, look at how the story is formatted. Then Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there, were, now there was much grass in the place so that the men sat down in numbers of about 5,000. So again, who is taking the leadership role here? Jesus is, right? Jesus tells his disciple, listen, let the people sit down. So he is still taking on that role as leader. But what does that fully mean? Even though he might be making the decisions, doing what's best for his family, that doesn't mean that he doesn't become the servant in this story as well. All right. So then G first Jesus says, he tells his disciples, right? Make the people sit down. He's taking that role of leader. 
verse 11. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he gave thanks, he distributed them to the disciples. So who's working here? Jesus is. He is the first one to take on that serving role. He takes the bread, breaks the bread, and passes it out. Takes the fish, passes it out. Now, again, remember, they fed 5,000 people. They had baskets and baskets and baskets of this fish and bread, which means Jesus was breaking bread and breaking fish probably for hours. All right. So he was very much doing the work of a servant here. All right. However, and this is what I love about the story. What we see in the story isn't just Jesus serving, but we start seeing that, that kind of uh, compatibility, that sharing of the work. Because in verse 11, let me read it again. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples and the disciples to those sitting down. And likewise, the fish, as much as they could, as much as they wanted. So in this story, we see that perfect balance here. Yes, Jesus makes the decision, but then he automatically becomes the servant. And he begins that role of serving. But then we also see the disciples becoming servants and sharing in that work. All right. Jesus works, the, the, the church works, and the world benefits. All right. Um, verse 12. So when they had filled, he said to the disciples, gather, gather up the fragrant fragments that remain so that nothing is left. And here again, you see him being the leader again, right? Telling them, listen, this is what we need to do. So you see Jesus being the leader, but also being the servant. That is the perfect head. That is our example, husbands. That is your role as the head or the leader of your household. Yes, you're going to do everything to uplift your wife or your family. Let's use the family. You're going to do everything to uplift your family. You're going to do everything to glorify your family. You're going to put your life below your, your, your family. Realize that, again, to be the head is exactly what's explained in the second half of Ephesians 5, to love your wife. All right. Realize that I've just explained the exact same thing. How do you become the leader? By loving. And how do you love? By becoming the servant by uplifting, putting yourself below your spouse, below your family, lifting them up so that they could be holy, so that they can be glorified. Though again, I would say, based on the verse in verse 21, submitting one to another, this is something that both should do. Now, I completely agree. Yes, the Bible says that men are the heads, right? Just as Christ is the head. So yes, men should take more of that responsibility and should serve more within the family. I completely agree with you. You should be the ultimate servant, even if your wife does also serve, but you should serve more than she does because you are the head, all right? However, there are always differentiations. There's always, and we talked a little bit about this, right? The fact that Nowadays, there's a very different dynamic, right? There's a very different dynamic. Now we have homes where both are working all day and both come home. Uh, and I would say, again, more than ever, that demands the equality, right? If both are working all day and both come home, it's not right that one gets to sit down on the sofa and relax and the other one gets to do all the work because they both work hard, right? That's just not just. That's maybe that's just my opinion now. I don't know. But uh, that's not how I see the Bible written. I see because you love your wife and because you realize that she worked hard all day, you're going to take that role of leader even more importantly and do everything you can to make her feel comfortable and loved and uplifted. All right. But again, and this is where the equality part becomes so important the wife, in seeing the love of her husband, We'll also want to show love to her husband and we'll also want to serve her husband and uplift her husband and, and serve her husband and do those things. 
once you start seeing that balance there, you create a, a household that truly is filled with, with love, all right? So I have no problem when the Bible says the husband is the, the head of, uh, uh, of the wife. The problem is what does that actually mean? Now, I know that there's probably be a few people here. Uh, the reason why this topic even comes up, yes, it has to do with marriage and stuff like that, but that's not really the big question, especially not nowadays. Um, the reason why Ephesians 5 has become so problematic in today's world isn't because of marriages. It's because of ordination. All right. Um, and this is where we're talking about a whole new ball game, right? Because this is where verses like Ephesians 5 are used to show, listen, women cannot be pastors because men are the heads, right? And you can see how that argument suddenly isn't about family anymore. Now we've expanded it into ordination. This is what we're going to talk about next week, all right? Um, <laughs> so you got to, you got to hold off a week uh, before we get into this, all right? Um, but what I am going to do now, so again, you might have questions about ordination. This is why I put this slide up, by the way, save it for next week. Cause I'm sure there's people that already have, you know, oh, but this, 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 all right. Ordination. We're going to talk about next week. Uh, today I want to focus on the, the dual role, the, the roles of, of a husband and a wife and what those roles actually mean. All right. Biblically speaking, not worldly speaking. Biblically speaking, what do those two, those two roles mean in a practical sense, all right, in a biblical sense? Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to pray now. If anyone has any questions, uh, feel, free, feel free to ask uh, in, in a second, all right? So let's pray first. God, again, thank you so much uh, for, for your word, for your guidance, for being the example in our lives, Lord. Uh, it's incredible that you, as the Son of God, uh, who has a throne in heaven, uh, who, is, who is only next, you know, only second to the Father himself, the, the, the God of the universe. And yet, by being that leader, you became the ultimate servant in our lives, Lord. Not just while you were on earth, not just in the way that you became a human being, but even today, Lord, today, Jesus, you still serve us. You still spend day and night forgiving sins, guiding us, helping us, doing everything you can to uplift us and to make us holy and glorified. Thank you so much for being that kind of a leader, Lord, the kind of a head, the kind of a leader that puts himself below us so that you can pick us up, so that you can raise us up. Thank you, God, for being that head of our church, of our lives. Um, be with the church, Lord, be with every relationship, with every family, with every couple. Uh, it isn't easy, Lord. We know uh, it's a struggle to live in unity, to live in love and to grow in love. But I pray, God, that through your Bible, through your word, that we can work together to create happy marriages, to create that, that balance and that love uh, that, that you desire, Lord. Help us truly uh, as a church, to submit one to another, Lord, to lift each other up. I pray this, God, um, not because we're worthy, but because you're worthy, Lord, because you are so good, good to us. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, let me close the PowerPoint here. Uh, feel free to take it off of mute. Well, let's try to do this in a, a respectful way so it's not everyone yelling at me all at once. Um, but uh, any questions or, or comments? Pastor, do you want this part recorded also? Uh, let, let's turn it off just in case people have any sort of private stuff. I don't want to, no yeah, yeah, I don't want to go into that. Any, any comments? 